to, to share greetings in the awesome and wonderful and magnificent, marvelous name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Welcome in to a Thursday noon edition of MTV Teaching. Um, I praise God that I've been privileged and honored to serve as pastor and chief executive officer of the Mount Vernon Baptist Church for the past 34 years, and God knows it has been a blessing. Last night we taught a lesson on the history of the English Bible, and I was in my office at the church, and the lighting was not very good, and so I thought I would come back on today and redo the broadcast. Emerald, you need to be in school as opposed to watching me and uh, redo the broadcast. So if you know of anyone who may be interested in, uh, Pat, good evening, good midday to you. If you know someone who may be interested in learning the history of the English Bible, call them, text them, email them, send them a pigeon and tell them to tune in to Facebook Live as we teach you a brief uh, condensed history of the English Bible. Dr. Gina Jennings Boykins, good afternoon to you. If I were to ask most of you how we get the English Bible, 99.999, uh, Ms. Brown, good afternoon to you, 0.999% of you would not have a clue as to how we arrived at a English Bible. When I was growing up, the King James Version, uh, the old church, um, acted like the King James Versions came directly from God and bypassed humanity and came directly from God. And I want to know and I want to teach you how we arrived at the King James authorized version of the Bible. In order to understand biblical history, we must go all the way back to the Jewish nation or to the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew scripture was called, or still called, the Tanakh, T-A-N-A-K-H. I think last night I spelled the T-E-N, but y'all know my spelling is atrocious. So we go back to the Tanakh, capital T-A-N-A-K-H. In the Hebrew language, they pronounced vowels, but they did not write them. So the T and the N and the K would be an acronym. And the T stands for the Torah, which are the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, Genesis, which means foundation, Exodus, which when they exited, uh, Rosario, good afternoon to you, Exodus is when the Israelites exited out of Egypt, Leviticus was, means law, Numbers means the numbering of the tribes, and Deuteronomy means the second law. So the T in the Tanakh, stands for the Torah or the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. The N stands for Nibian, Nibian, uh, which represents the prophets, <laughs> Lord have mercy. And then the K is the Ketavin, which represents the writings. There are 24 books in the Tanakh, where there are 39 uh, Old Testament books in our Bible, they are the same books. Uh, they are just organized differently. For example, in our Bible, we have 12 minor prophets. In the Tanakh, you only had one book called basically the minor prophets. And so they are the same books. They are just organized differently. So the first uh, Bible uh, book or uh, scripture I want you to learn is the Tanakh. That is the Hebrew Bible. And then around 250 B.C., and remember B.C. means before Christ, A.D. means anno domini, and it never meant after death, but it has always been a Latin phrase, which means in the year of our Lord. 
So about 250 years before the birth of Christ, you remember about this time, Alexander the Great had gone through the Mediterranean and had Hellenized uh, the Mediterranean. In other words, the dominant language now was not Hebrew or Aramaic. The dominant language was Greek. In 250 BC, around about 250 BC, there was a king in Alexandria, Egypt, by the name of Ptolemy, 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 whichever way you want to pronounce it, the second. And Ptolemy the second wanted to enlarge his library in Alexandria, Egypt. So what he does, Dr. Borkins, what he does, Miss Brown and Evangelist Frazier is he sends to Jerusalem and he sends for 72 biblical scholars, six from each tribe. Uh, and he brings them to Alexandria, Egypt. He sets them, sets them. He puts them um, in, a, in a separate room. And according to the legend, he gave them the uh, Bible to translate. Gwen Hutchinson, good evening to you. And at the end of 72 days, each 72 scholars came, emerged from the room and had the exact same translations. The ex Every one of them. Now, if you believe that, uh, I, I've got some swamp land that I need to sell you, but that's the, now, now where do we get that from? We get that from a letter a called, a, something called the letter from, of Aristius. So, and this document is often, or this biblical translation is often abbreviated by XL, L, I mean LXX, uh, because it became known as the Septuagint, S-E-P-T-U-A-G-I-N-T. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scripture. We're making our way to the English Bible. We're making our way because, as Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant. I want you to understand, those who watch my broadcast, where we get the English Bible, at least have a head knowledge of where we get the English Bible. It's called the Septuagint, and it is, it is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. So there are two things that you should have learned, Ms. Benson, already about the history of the English Bible. The Tanakh is the Hebrew Bible, T-N-K, and the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The Septuagint would, would have been the Bible that Jesus, his disciples, and the early church would have uh, read and would have quoted. Then around, let, let's fast forward to about 380, uh, uh, the Catholic Church commissioned or the Pope commissioned St. Jerome to translate the Bible into the vernacular of Latin. So we have the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint, which is the Greek, which is the Bible for the Greek speaking Jews, and then uh, Angela Sims, good morning to you, or good afternoon to you. Then we have the Latin Vulgate in about 382, which uh, where they translated the Bible into Latin. So we, now we have a Hebrew Bible, we have a Greek Bible, and we have a Latin Bible. And the Latin Bible, the uh, Latin Vulgate, the word Vulgate, interestingly enough, in our uh, culture means nasty or something vulgar. Actually, that's where the word Vulgate comes from. Etymologically, the word Vulgate is come from the word vulgar. And in Latin, the word vulgar means, the word vulgar means common. And so the Latin Vulgate would have been in the common language of the people. And so the uh, Latin Vulgate was to the Catholic Church what the uh, King James Version became uh, to the uh, Protestant church. It was the creme de la creme of Bibles. So we have the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. We have the, you don't have to learn the date, the Septuagint in 250, the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible, or translation of the Hebrew Bible. And then in, the, in 380, we get Jerome and the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate become the creme de la creme of, of Bibles that the Catholic Church would use, oh my God, all the way up until at least the Reformation, and, and some would even suggest beyond the Reformation. Uh, the problem with the Latin Vulgate is that most Protestant historians and theologians will suggest that 
it was corrupt. It had a tremendous amount of inaccuracies and they attribute this to the Catholic Church. Now remember, I'm not a theologian, I'm, a, I'm not even a historian, I'm a researcher. So I am presenting this information from a Protestant's perspective. Now I'm gonna go back and research this from a Catholic perspective, but from the Protestant theologians and historians and uh, theological academicians perspective, not only was the Latin Vulgate, the Catholic Bible, at least the Bible of the Roman Catholic Church was corrupt, but the Catholic Church was also corrupt. They were doing things like selling indulgences. What's that? Selling indulgences meant that you could go, that, that, that when you sinned, all you had to do was go to the priest and pay him a certain amount of money and he would forgive you of your sins. That's called uh, selling indulgences. The Pope uh, basically had declared himself the higher authority over the word of God. Uh, they were teaching purgatory, that there was a holding place that when you die, that either you can pay or pray your way out of purgatory um, 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 uh, based on the Catholic Church doctrine. Uh, what else? Uh, they were teaching transubstantiation. And what is transubstantiation? Transubstantiation is the idea that when you take what they call in the Catholic Church, the Eucharist, the U, E-U is always a prefix for a whole, a well. It's the Eucharist, it's the whole body of Christ. And according to the Catholic Church, transubstantiation meant that when we take the communion or what they call the Eucharist, uh, the uh, bread and wine miraculously transforms itself into the literal body and into the uh, blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Um, and so these were things that you could find in the Latin Vulgate um, and they were perpetrated by the Catholic Church. Now let's fast forward to the 1300s. Uh, by this time, like I said, the church was rooted in uh, the Catholic Church, it was still one. The word Catholic means universal. They had had the great uh, divide um, in the 10 hundreds uh, where the, the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox decided to go their separate ways, but it was still one church under the auspices of, uh, although they had two popes, they, uh, it was, they, they both were under the auspices of the Catholic Church. Mad, I'm, I'm sorry, the Catholic service was done in Latin. Uh, the problem with that is the only people that spoke Latin at this point were the aristocrats, the priests, and those who were uh, academias, those who were highly educated. Those were the only people who understand what's going on. In the Catholic Church, there is no Protestant Church, there is no Baptist, there is no Methodist, there is no Pentecostal, there is no Holiness, there is no Lutheran Church. There's only the Catholic Church. And the law in the land is that, uh, in England, is that the Bible cannot be um, translated into any language other than Latin. Well, what's the problem with that? The problem is uh, there were all kinds of languages, uh, Sherelle, uh, in, in Europe, you had French, you had German, you had English, you had all kinds of languages, but the Catholic Church, which ruled the people, only allowed the uh, service to be in Latin and only, about, uh, only allowed the Bible to be translated into Latin. As a matter of fact, the only people that really uh, spoke Latin as it related to the church were the priests. And can you imagine going to church and going to church Sunday. Number one, you don't have a Bible, so you, don't, so you really don't know what it says. And then the guy you're listening to is speaking a language that you don't even understand. How in the world can you have church and go to church and the language is not even in the dialect or the vernacular that you have? Now, watch this. If you control the Bible and you the only one can understand what it says, then you can say what you want to say that it says, and it does not necessarily have to be accurate. And this what was, and this what was going on in the Catholic Church. They were going to church, Dr. Borkin, without a Bible because, um, 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 and this service was in a, in a language that they, that they didn't even understand. 
with the 13th century, I mean the 1300s of the 14th century now. And there arose a theologian by the name of Wycliffe. Some call him Wycliffe, W-Y-C-L-I-F-F. Feel free to Google, to ask um, um, your search engine, whatever it is about Wycliffe or Wycliffe. We're in the 1300s now. Uh, Wycliffe, Wycliffe, with a hidden way you want to pronounce it, uh, he has a desire to put the Bible in the vernacular of the people. Wycliffe looked around and said, why in the world are people going to these services? Why in the world are we, uh, uh, do we have a Bible, Ms. DeBose, uh, that we don't even, number one, we, we don't have a copy of it. Number two, we don't even have, uh, we don't even understand what the priest saying. So what he wants to do is to translate the Bible into English. So what the way Cliff does is he translates uh, the Bible, uh, some of the Bible anyway, into English. And this is about 1380. Uh, the late 14th century, and Wycliffe is credited with uh, producing the first English uh, scripture. They call it the Bible. It's not a Bible, but we can call it a Bible uh, just for the sake of this broadcast. He is credited with producing the first English manuscript Bible, okay? And manuscript from the two words, manuscriptus, which means that it was handwritten. That's all the manuscript is, is a handwritten document. Um, uh, uh, when I teach you um, um, about the codexes, a, the difference between a codex and um, a manuscript is, a manuscript is handwritten, handwritten document. A codex is a handwritten document that's bound like a book. And you have the codex uh, of Sinaiticus, you got the, uh, Codex Vaticanus, and we'll, and we'll teach you about codexes later on. Okay, somebody took one day and said, why you got to be so deep? Because too many people are shallow. And this kind of teaching, it is not for everybody. Glory to God. But if you want to know more about theology, then let's hang out, let's talk, let's teach. So Wycliffe, about 380, produces the first handwritten English uh, portion of, uh, of the Bible, um, um, in the 1300s. Well, now let's move from the 1300s to the 1400s. Uh, not a whole lot of uh, English manuscripts or Bible are written then, but two major, major, major events happened in the 1400s. Number one, it was the, uh, the fall of Constantinople um, um, uh, at, at Constantinople, which was in the east. Uh, they had uh, a tremendous amount of the, not original, but the close to original Greek manuscript. They had the Greek, uh, uh, the great Greek theologians there. And when Constant Constantinople fell, then these uh, Greek scholars came and migrated to the West. And, and, and with their migration came the uh, authentic Greek manuscripts. Uh, uh, now, they were in segments. Um, 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 but uh, it was a and uh, the Renaissance period, the Enlightening period, came to the West. Now they had some of the um, almost original Greek manuscripts. So that was that that was the first uh, momentous thing that happened. The second momentous thing that happened in the 1400 was the invention of the uh, Gutenberg movable printing, a uh, movable type printing press. So now they could get material printed and they could get it out in a hurry less uh, uh, with less complications, with less. And it was less expensive because and it took less time because in order for Wycliffe to produce one Bible, he had some disciples that they call La uh, Lords. Uh, uh, it, it is reported that it took them between 10 months and a year to hand write. I mean, it was beautifully handwritten uh, to hand write these uh, partial what I call partial Bible. So some will suggest that Wycliffe started the uh, Reformation. Uh, he may have lit the candle that started the flame that would burn in the Reformation, but the Reformation wouldn't actually uh, uh, take off until um, a little bit later. So that's uh, the Tanakh, that's the Septuagint, that's the Latin Vulgate, and that's uh, Mr. Wycliffe. And that's the fall of Constantinople, 1400s, and uh, the invention of the Gutenberg printing press. I'm trying to wrap them, I'm trying to move as expeditiously as I can, but to cover as much as I can. So we've gone to 1300s, the 1400s. Now let's fast forward to the 1500s, and this 
is a a the a the real um um uh, blossoming time if you will of the english bible uh let's go back to 15 let's uh start at 1516 in 1516 there was a fellow uh by the name of erasmus uh erasmus got hold of some of the manuscripts that had come the greek manuscripts um, that had come from uh, the east at the fall of Constantinople. He read them and he was reported to have said something like either we're not Christians or this not the Bible. In other words, he looked at the, uh, the Greek fragments that they had brought from the east and he compared it to the Latin Vulgate and he realized that the Vulgate was not accurate, that there were tremendous amounts of inaccuracies in the Latin Vulgate. And according, once again, according to Protestant historians and theologians, it was uh, corrupt at its core. So what Erasmus does is he translates, uh, uh, he's responsible for the first translation of the New Testament into Greek. All right, so that's Erastimus, and then years later, uh, retrospectively, he would become basically the father of what they call Texas, oh my God, Texas Receptus. Okay, maybe we'll teach you about the Texas Receptus later, but if you want to look that up, you're welcome to look up the Texas Receptus. Okay, so that's 1516. Now, in, uh, now Erasmus set the tone for Martin Luther, and his reformation in 1517. Martin Luther was a German monk who felt, uh, just like Wycliffe, that the Bible should be uh, put in the vernacular of the Christians. How in the world can you live a book then you don't that you don't have in your possession? So Martin Luther started the Reformation proper. He uh, posted his 95 contentions against the church uh, or his 95 theses to the door and started the reformation of the Protestant movement proper. And it would continue to move and the flames of fire would burn throughout Europe. <laughs> oh my God, I didn't say that. The flames of fire would burn throughout Europe. Uh, Martin Luther uh, is in Germany and starts the Lutheran church. Uh, John Calvin is in Switzerland with his Calvinism. Uh, John Knox would be in Scotland and start the Presbyterian church. And King Henry VIII of England would ultimately start the, Ang uh, the Anglican church or the church of England. Uh, when Martin Luther uh, nailed his 95 theses to the door of uh, the King of England was a king by the name of Henry VIII. King Henry VIII ruled England from, oh my God, 1519 to 1547. Um, and when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door, uh, Henry VIII was uh, solidly a Catholic. Or, 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 or he followed a solid proponent of Catholicism uh, that would change several years later. As a matter of fact, he was such a proponent of Catholicism. And the reason I say this is because the making of the Bible, I know y'all think the Bible men just sat down and then and, and they just got this poop from God. That ain't how it happened. And every person that had a hand in creating the Bible wasn't necessarily writing under the anointing of God. Okay. <laughs> Um, so Henry VIII uh, actually wrote a book entitled Defense of the Seven Sacraments, which gave the Catholics a counter argument to Martin Luther's and the reformist arguments. Um, um, and the Pope um, was so pleased with, um, Mar um, with um, Henry VIII's book that he gave the monarchy a title and the title was of the defender of the faith. And that's a title that the monarchy still uh, relishes uh, today, the defender of the faith. So we got the Tanakh, we got the Septuagint 250 in 380s, we got the Latin Vulgate in the 1300s, 
we got Wycliffe, 1400s, we got the invention of the print press, and we have the fall of Constantinople. In 1516, we have Erasmus, okay, uh, first translation of the New Testament into Greek. 1517, we got Martin Luther and the Reformation. Um, oh my God, um, what now? Uh, 15, now let's move forward to 15. The re okay, and um, uh, King Henry VIII will be king under four of the translations of the Bible into English. The first one uh, is uh, William Tyndale. Some call him William Tyndale, 15. And some say 1526, 1526, so I just put 1525 because that's easier for me to re remember it. And because they don't agree, I just put it somewhere in the middle. Uh, William Tyndale uh, was a theologian in England, and he had the vision once uh, like a Wycliffe of putting the Bible in the hand of the common man. As a matter of fact, William Tyndale was reportedly have said to another theologian that if the Lord spared him, uh, uh, he would fix it so that the boy who plows the field would know more than this other theologian. His lifelong dream of William Tyndale was to get the Bible printed in English, but it is right now, at that point, it was illegal to print a Bible in, in any other language other than, than Latin because the church wanted to control the people and they controlled the people by controlling the Bible. So William Tyndale um, is credited with having the first printed English Bible. He really didn't print the whole Bible. He printed some of the, he did, uh, he produced some of the Gospels and uh, maybe Jonah and a few of the Old Testament books. Uh, one of the things Tyndale would do, he was, he would, uh, he was, a, um, uh, he, he was always redoing what he did. And one of the things that, uh, he was always revising stuff. So he really didn't get to do a whole lot, but what, it, but some of the thing that Tyndale or Tyndale uh, did, did do was he uh, created some words that were not previously in the Bible. For example, uh, the Greek word for uh, where we get the word repent is metanoia. And the, um, the Sept, not Septuagint, the Latin Vulgate read, except you do, except you do penance, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. Well, do penance in that culture meant except you go through the priest, confess, pay the pen, uh, uh, pay the uh, 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 pay pay the priest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It meant going through the Catholic ritual, or, or it meant doing works. When Tyndale saw do penance, he changed that word to no. It, uh, uh, he changed it to in his Bible, in the English Tyndale Bible, to be repent, meaning that you must turn. From your way, so uh, uh, the English language is developing. Okay, so it went from Old English to Middle English to Elizabethan English to Modern English, and these words are changing, and they are inventing new words. And this is a good time to uh, suggest to you, in particular, if you are a pastor, preacher, teacher, or evangelist, please understand the difference between um, uh, translating a word and transliterating a word. When you translate a word, you take a word from one language to another one based on its meaning. If when you transliterate a word, you take a word based on its spelling. And when you translate a word, you keep the word meaning. When you transliterate a word, you create a new word. <laughs> and the new word meaning is the meaning that you attach to the word. For example, when they got to the word baptism, means to immerse, it means to dip, it means to take under. Okay, so when they, this is fascinating theology. So when they got to the word baptizio, instead of translating the word baptizio, they created a word by transliterating it based on its spelling and created the word baptize. Prior to that, there was no English word baptize. A proper translation of the word baptizio would have been to immerse, to dip. So when the Bible says, except you be baptized 
a proper translation would be, except you be dipped in, except you be immersed in. But because they wanted, okay, because they didn't want to offend anybody, they created the word baptized, and therefore you can attach any meaning you want to have to the word baptized. Because the Catholic Church didn't immerse, they sprinkled. So if you create a word baptized, then you could, uh, you could attach the word, the meaning sprinkle to it, or you can attach the real meaning that um, a Tyndale did, which is to immerse. Okay, so, so uh, uh, where the uh, Latin Vulgate had the word uh, ecclesi ecclesia, which is where we get our word church, the Catholic, uh, the uh, Latin Vulgate had the word church, but it meant the ecclesiastical order, the Pope, the bishops, and everything that comes with the ecclesiastical order. Tyndale got to e ecclesia, and he translated the word not church, he translated the word congregation. When he got to the word, uh, the Latin Vulgate had the word priest in it, to the priest, which once again has the connotation of the Catholic hierarchy. He changed that word to congregate, I mean, uh, to elders. Okay, when the, where the Latin Vulgate had uh, the greatest of these is charity, in that vernacular, the word charity meant outside works. So, so, so he changed that to love, not an outside work, but an inward emotional feeling. So, so that was William Tyndale in what we're calling 1525. They ended up now the, uh, Henry VIII put a bounty out on Tyndale and, uh, the Catholic church had a bounty out on Tyndale. Okay. And, uh, it, it is reported, uh, and the, uh, Catholic Church found Tyndale before uh, the uh, Henry the Eighth people could find him. And guess what the Catholic Church did to him? You guess right, Evangelist Frazier. They took him, tied him to a stake, choked him to death, and then burned him. The Catholic Church, why? Because he translated the Bible against the law from into English from uh, Latin. I mean, uh, uh, from the Latin Vulgate. Uh, um, he translated the Bible. Uh, into English, which was against the law. Okay, so they burned him, and his last dying words were, as they report him, as they reported him, "Lord, open the eyes of the king." Now, there's some debate about whether or not go, uh, uh, God opened the eyes of the king. Several years later, uh, King Henry VIII leaves the uh, Catholicism, and he leaves the Catholic Church. Uh, why did he leave? Let's see if God opened his eyes. L let me get this story real short. Uh, Henry VIII was married to a woman by the name of Catherine of Aragon. She was a Spanish woman, um, um, but she could not bear him any children. Had about four or five miscarriages, and finally, uh, they uh, she did bear him a daughter, and they named the daughter Mary. Um, uh, Henry VIII wanted a male heir. He falls in love with this woman by the name of Anne Boleyn. Uh, Anne Boleyn, to put in everyday, everyday Negro terms, refuses to be a side chick. So uh, in order for them to hook up, he needs to get a divorce. So he goes to the Pope and he goes to the Pope in Parliament and asks to get a divorce. And they go through this long process of, of, of trying to get a divorce. The Pope and says, no, I will not grant you a divorce. So Henry VIII said to hell with the Catholic Church, starts his own denomination. Okay, starts his own denomination and declares himself in a law in 1534. It's called the Act of Supremacy. And what the Act of Supremacy did was uh, King Henry VIII said, the Pope is no longer in charge of the church in England. The monarchy is. I'm the head one in charge. He eliminated the uh, Pope being the head, changed the order. He is the head, and under him is a person called the Archbishop of Canterbury. He closes the Catholic monarch, seizes the Catholic churches, seizes his property, seizes his land. Some say he sells it. Some says he gives it away. And now he is done with the Catholic Church. He starts the Church of England or the Anglican Church. And when it comes to America, it will ultimately become the Presbyterian Church. So 
he goes to the Archbishop of Canterbury, a guy by the name of Cramus. I need a boy. Cramus said, cool. He divorces his wife by the name of Catherine, and he marries Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn can't give him any children either. So she finally has a daughter, and they name her Mary. Henry VIII go through about four or five wives, finally get a son. They name him Henry VI. <laughs> Glory to God. So you see, it's up to you whether you want to decide whether God opened the eyes of the king or the king eyes open because he wanted to marry this woman and the Pope wouldn't give him permission. To give. So he leaves the church, the, the Catholic church. Now he takes England Protestant. All right. So now we have Tyndale in 1525. In 1535, uh, a one of Tyndale's editors and associates, a guy by the name of Miles Coverdale, um, translates the Bible into English, and he's credited with being uh, producing the first complete English Bible. All right, remember Wycliffe in the 1300s produced a partial uh, Bible. Wycliffe translated his Bible from the Latin Vulgate. Um, and then that was Tyndale in 1525 produced the first printed Bible, but not the entire Bible. Coverdale produced the entire Old and New Testament in 1535. Uh, Coverdale ended up doing about 20, um, um, 20 different revisions of his Bible. They would read them. Somebody would say, this ain't right. Then they go back and change them. Then they say, this ain't right. They go back and change them. And this is how the Bible was developing before we get the King James authorized edition of the Bible. So that's 1535. Let's move on and try to speed this up. 1537, another one of Tyndale's associate by the name of John Rogers produces a Bible. And remember the Wycliffe Bible was called the Wycliffe Bible because Wycliffe produced it. Remember that the Coverdale, I'm sorry, the Tyndale Bible was called the Tyndale Bible because Tyndale produced it. The Coverdale Bible was called the Coverdale Bible because Coverdale produced it. But the Matthews Bible was not produced by Matthews. It was produced by a guy by the name of John Rogers. John Rogers produced it under a false name, some say because he didn't want to get killed, and others say because he didn't want it connected to the Time Bible. But the Coverdale Bible and the Matthew Bible are strictly uh, uh, extensions of the uh, Tyndale Bible with their own little twist. So each one that's interpreting the Bible, they put their own little twist to it. <laughs> a guy by the name of John Rogers. Okay, uh, let's move on. 1539, uh, there's something called the Great Bible. And this was the first Bible authorized. Re remember in 1534, uh, I'm sorry, remember um, um, the Act of Supremacy um, where uh, Henry VIII uh, declared himself the head of the church in England? Well, by, uh, uh, by 1539, Henry VIII actually authorizes a Bible. So this be it, it became known as the Great Bible which is slightly different from the Matthew's Bible, which is slightly different from the Coverdale Bible, which is slightly different from the Tyndale Bible, which is slightly different from Erasmus' work, which is slightly different from um, uh, the Vulgate, the Septuagint, and the Tanakh. We've gone through all of these different translations of the Bible and going to ultimately end up with the King James authorized version, okay? Uh, so, th so the Great Bible is also called the Chain Bible. Uh, this is kind of humorous because the Bible was so big uh, and King Henry VIII ordered it chained to the pulpit. It was literally chained to the pulpit and a reader was provided. So Henry VIII reigns Eng reign in England from, oh my God, when is it? Uh, 1519 to 1547. After Henry VIII dies, his son, uh, Edward VI, come to the throne. He reigned from 1547 to 1553. Not much change in the Bible translation, but in, from 1553 to 1558, his scorned and hurt and angry daughter from his first wife, Catherine, becomes the head of the monarchy, the queen, and she's bitter and angry, and she wants to take England back to Catholicism. And what and this is where and, and the Protestants have named her Bloody Mary. That's where we get the concept of Bloody Mary. All right. Um, um, what Mary does is 
Mary gathers a lot of the Protestant theologians in the name of let's come, have a come to Jesus meeting. And when he get there, Pat, she kills them all. Kills about 300 of the Protestant leaders. Some of them flee. Coverdale goes to Germany. Um, um, Mary reigned from 15, oh my God, 53 to 1558. Um, in 1560, uh, a very influential Bible is produced. It's called the Geneva Bible in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, our friend Miles Coverdale is there. Um, uh, it's called the Geneva Bible, and the Geneva Bible was the first study Bible. It 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 um it uh, was the first Bible to separate verses and chapters, etc. 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 The Geneva Bible um, was the Bible that most say came over on the Mayflower with the Pilgrims and came with the with the Puritans. Um, the, uh, the Geneva Bible had tremendous commentaries on it. Like I said, it was said to be the first, uh, study Bible. And then in 1568, Elizabeth, Elizabeth reigned from 1558. She dies in 1603. Um, Elizabeth authorizes them to write what's called the Bishop's Bible. And Elizabeth dies in, you've heard of the Elizabethan period. She dies in 1603. Parliament goes and to Scotland and bring back a, a sin for a fellow by the name of King James the uh, sixth or eighth of Scotland. I don't I don't remember which one. And he became, and he comes to England and becomes King James the first of England. Some Puritans come to him and want him to, they want him to do a whole lot of stuff, but he authorizes the King James Bible to be written. He has about 15 uh, qualifiers, things that they, that, that they need to adhere to. Uh, he got the best, the best of the best scholars, Westminster, um, uh, Oxford, and I forgot the other place, it was meant for Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, they divided them in, into section, gave them, uh, and they had access to all of the Bible, Erasmus' work, Martin Luther's, uh, uh, Tyndale, Coverdale, Matthew's, Great, Geneva, Bishop. They had access to all of the Bibles. And um, they would, the interpreters interpreted the Bible, then they came and read it to a committee, and then the Things that the committee didn't agree with, they redid and came back and read it to the committee again. And after it left the committee, it went to through a bishop. Uh, it went to some bishops. The bishops changed some stuff and went back to the committee. And then it went to the Archbishop of Canterbury. And the report is he changed some things and sent it back. And he sent it back to the Archbishop of Can. They want to make sure they got it right. And then it ultimately went to King James for the final authorization. And in 1611, we get the King James authorized version of the Bible published. So when people tell you that the Bible is the authentic word of God, you need to ask them, which Bible are you talking about? Because see, most people don't understand the history of how we got the Bible. I didn't tell you about uh, a document called, a, a writing called the Masoretic Text, because the theologians don't, uh, don't, don't, agree as to the time frame. Some put the Masoretic text at 500 AD and some put it as far as 900 AD. But what the Masoretic text was, remember I told you that the, remember I told you that the uh, Hebrew language, they didn't write the vowels. So when the, uh, there was some Masoretes in the Masoretes in Tiberias who translated the Tanakh and they added the accents, they added the vowels and they added commentaries which became known as the Masoretic text. And they were, com and the Masoretic text was competing with the Septuagint. Why did he know that? Because when Jesus and his disciples quote the Old Testament, and this gets deep, Dr. Borkin, they quote mostly from the 
Septuagint. I teach a lesson, a class uh, that's, that, um, the, where I actually go through the differences between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. Um, and because they are different, uh, they, uh, they, they differ. And one of the, and the greatest difference between the Masoretic text, okay, and, and, and let me get back to my point. Uh, Jesus, Jesus and the disciples quoted the Septuagint, but when the English translators translated, they mostly quoted the Masoretic text. So sometimes when you read your Bible and it says, and Isaiah said, you, you will go to Isaiah and that ain't what Isaiah said. <laughs> and the reason is not what Isaiah said is because the English version is quoting the Masoretic text and the uh, people and the writer of the New Testament was quoting the Septuagint. A perfect example of this is, uh, I wrote this down, is Isaiah 7, 14. Remember, it basically says, and Matthew 1, 23, it basically says that uh, there will be a virgin that will have a child. Well, the uh, Septuagint says the virgin will have the child. That ain't the way the Masoretic text reads. The Masoretic text translate that word young virgin. And it's a major difference between a young virgin having a child. I'm sorry. They translated young girl, a young maiden. There's a big difference between saying a young girl will have a child and a virgin will have a child. And the Masoretic text says a young girl will have a child. And the Septuagint says that a virgin will have a child. And so when the RSV first came out, they were translating their, the RSV from the Masoretic text, and they got a whole lot of trouble because they translated it the same way. They said a young girl will have a child, and now they've changed it, and they've gone to a virgin will have a child. Oh, Lord have mercy. I've been over an hour. No, I haven't. I started at 1245. Okay, so um, um, that's the history of the of the English Bible. Now, there was another uh, uh, um, scripture I didn't tell you about, which was the um, Samaritan Pentateuch. Okay, you can look that up. But that is the, that's how we ultimately got the English Bible. Now, next time I'm going to teach you how we got the nominations. Okay, how we get all the denominations. That's it. Hopefully, you all learned something. Go back and watch the tape. If you really want to be learned, oh my God, be learned. <laughs> oh my God, you're stupid. If you really want to learn about the history of the Bible, when you go through it, Google, uh, whatever your search engine is, Google Tanakh, Google Septuagint, Google Latin Vulgate, however you do your research, Google Wycliffe, Google Erasmus. Fact check me. It's okay. I challenge you to. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God has to say. Peace, y'all.